nice to have you on my podcast, by the way. Thank you for having me. <laughs> why? So, so I want to get into your background a little bit later, but why, why did you decide to come to Iceland? Iceland chose me. Iceland chose you? Yeah, I like okay. to always say that. Uh, I was listening. There's, Icelandic music is super popular in Australia. Mm -hmm. Super popular. So there was this guy that I saw twice live. His name was, um, as they say overseas, Askir. And I was like, I love that look. Every time I say it, everybody's like, <laughs> Askir who? And I'm like, no, Askir, the guy that sells out the opera house. Ah. Like he is such a good musician. He played there all the time, 2016. I played him on repeat. And I found out he was this, from this place called Iceland. And I was like, Iceland? And then there was a... Uh, I don't watch TV, but my housemates were watching The Bachelor and there was a, a TV show and a girl on there mentioned that her favorite place she's ever traveled to is Iceland. And I was like, fuck it, I'm going. So I got up out of my seat, went to my room and booked a one-way ticket to Europe knowing I was going to end up in Iceland. And I flew to Europe, ended up a, a week later... I came to Iceland and I just fell in love after three days and I was like crying because of the nature. I have a video of me crying and I'm literally on the road to Flúðir. There's nothing around. It's flat and I'm crying. I'm like, this is the most beautiful thing I've <laughs> ever seen in my life. It's so funny now to look back on. Yeah, but then crazy. I left, tried to figure out a way to stay, really expensive, yada, yada. Um, and then the universe brought me back. And I was meant to be here for a month and it ended up being now seven and a half, almost eight years. But it's very, it sounds like a very drastic decision because Australia is so far away from Iceland yeah. to go only one way. Had you before that, had you al were you already brave with, with traveling and making yeah. decisions like that? Yes. I make very drastic decisions very fast. <laughs> I always have. You've always so, been that way. Yeah. And I've lived overseas. Uh, I was born in Australia and then I lived in Poland from five to 11. So I'd known what it feels like to live in different places around the world. And then at 19, I started traveling solo, not 18, solo around the world. And then um, 18 to 25, I was traveling for three months a year, um, just exploring. And I just, I remember around 25, this little voice inside my head just said, if you don't live in Europe, if you don't leave and live in Europe right now as an adult, you'll never experience living in Europe as an adult. And so it was such an annoying voice. My my heart just said, you got to go. And I had no choice, but I had to go. I'm so interested in this and curious in general about people. I think most people have these voices that you're talking about, yeah. but a lot of people don't act on them. Oh, yeah. And then slowly but surely the voice becomes more and more distant and it's more difficult to hear it because you're ignoring it. I, yeah, maybe. Mine just gets louder and more obnoxious <laughs> and I get more anxious and depressed and like I'm going to pop, like a balloon's about to pop. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with the music thing now. I just am releasing an album soon. My first song drops tomorrow and it's 22 years of that voice. And I so hard, I tried to squish it so much for 22 years. And every day it was like, do music, do music. And I was like, this doesn't make sense. Can I just, can you just let it go? And I went and did so many different other things to just shut that voice up. And eventually I couldn't. I was, I feel myself physically getting sick when I don't follow these voices. But okay, you came here yeah. and then you, you, you went back and the universe brought you back, you said. Yes. How did the universe bring you back? <laughs> I was at the airport. I land in Poland because there's so many flights to Poland from Iceland because mm -hmm. there's so many Polish people here. Uh, I land at the airport at 2 a.m. in Gdańsk um, and there's no internet, there's no buses, there's, there's no trains, there's nothing to get me from the airport to my hostel. Um which is 30 minutes away. So I'm stuck there. I'm on my computer trying to find a way out, but there's no internet. <laughs> and this guy walks past me, three guys. One of them says, hey, there's no internet here. Come with us. And I just looked at him and I was like, close my laptop. Okay. At 2 a.m. in the morning. So crazy. Duh. Anyway, did it. Uh, he ended up being a Polish that lives in Iceland as well. And then we, um, we talked and he said, there's a place... 
uh, my friend runs, uh, you could go relax him because I told him I was really stressed in, uh, in Sydney and I just wanted to be in Iceland for a while, but it was so expensive. Um, and I actually had a cancer scare as well. That's why I left um, Australia because I, I was developing signs of potential uh, cervical cancer. Ah, so I wanted okay. to uh, clear my body from stress because I knew that was probably the mm. biggest contributor. And anyway, he said, there's this farm, you can relax there. I contacted them and they said, yeah, come stay with us. Um, they usually didn't even take volunteers or anybody to stay there for a while, but they granted me a month um, pretty affordably. And then within a week, I met my partner at the time and I ended up staying here for now that whole time. <laughs> and, and this thing you were describing in the beginning, like falling in love with, did that last... Falling in love with Iceland? Yeah, like like this feeling yeah. of feeling of being somewhere where you're just like, okay, I'm meant to be here and I really yeah. love this place. Yeah. It's weird because I'm a water baby. I am a sunshine baby, warmth, beach. That's my thing, like for sure. And yet, I don't know, there was something, it, it's like <laughs> you're just surviving a day in Iceland is, is um, you should give yourself a medal for it. <laughs> Every day, like the wind, like, yeah, I survived another day. <laughs> There's something that makes you feel alive about just, just living here, just driving for an hour during mm-hmm. crazy wind. You just feel alive always, until it gets really annoying. <laughs> I always think about the people that came here first. Like who, who were these people? They were crazy. Oh, they they must have been really crazy. But Icelandic people are crazy, so it makes sense. <laughs> well, how would you how would you describe? Because it's we have this saying in Iceland, the guests uh-huh. which means that the visitor sees it better than we do. Ah. Oh, so wh- wh- how, how how do you see Icelandic people after when you say they're crazy? Like what what is the essence of Icelandic people? The most badass people on the planet. Maybe besides Greenlandic people, because they're a bit more badass. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. You guys are so tough to withstand these conditions, to withstand this way of life. And I- I'm not surprised that everybody here is a creative in some way. Mm-hmm. Like you have to have an outlet for the conditions that you experience here. And people... Yeah, I don't know. You guys are just badass. And you have all the emotions. And there is similarities, funny enough, between Australians and Icelandic people. I think that's why, for some reason, we get on quite well. Yeah, that's what I was That's what I was thinking, like Australia and New Zealand. Yeah, we. I don't understand how, but there is a similarity of character. Yeah. yeah. Like a bit more rugged, not really polished, Uh Real, not like Americans, bless your souls, but like they're super polite. Like, oh my God, hi. Mm-hmm. Whereas Icelandic people, we don't have that, mm-hmm. which is really nice. I, li- I like that real authenticity. Yeah. So. But isn't that something that I think about when, when people come here as tourists and then they are new here? Yeah. And they see how like Icelandic people tend to be very very welcoming, very nice. To, uh-huh. But then when you start to live here, yeah. you start to see the other side. Yeah. <laughs> Which is good. Because again, course, I like course. the contra. I like reality. I like to see the real versions of people. And I don't think, again, why am I picking on Americans? I don't think Americans like to show Continue that. Continue to pick on them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love you guys. I lived there for a while and I <laughs> love that place. But I like that Icelandic people don't hide Eventually. No, even, not even that. Like if they like you, they like you. If they don't, they don't. And they'll make it known. Like you, you think can, so? Yeah. They'll, they'll avoid you. I, that, that's my, that's <laughs> more my opinion of like Russians or Finnish people or something. Well, that the cool thing and the weird thing about Iceland is because it's so small that even if you don't like someone, you're going to see them again. So true. you have to be sort of civil. True. Unless true. you're just going to have a fight every single time you see them, which yeah. eventually gets exhausting. Mm-hmm. So you have to just coexist with people you don't like. <gasps> 100%. Whoa, that's cool. Because you have to lean into the discomfort then of being in the presence of someone you don't want to be around instead of running away. 
Are you afraid? That's, that's a good point. Are Icelandic people afraid of conflict or not so much? In my view, I, I would say they're pretty conflict avoidant. Really? I, in my view. I don't know. Like, it's just maybe it's something because I see it in myself. Yeah. I, I'm try, I'm, I, I can feel like I need to develop my, my disagreeable side a little bit more sometimes. And I see it a lot in like codependency. Yeah. It's very common in Iceland. Like yeah. people, uh, and maybe, maybe that's why I'm friends with you guys. <laughs> maybe it's like that everywhere. I don't know, but but I, I I think in general Icelandic people are a bit conflict avoidant, and that's why you have this when people go downtown and they get drunk, everything yeah. comes out. True, that's true. Maybe but, that could be possible. Honestly, I'm no expert in human behavior. I think it's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we're all a bit fucked up. We are, we are. <laughs> what about your like your way of making a living? And I think you are inspiring a lot of like, for example, my girlfriend. She she's really inspired by you, and yeah. I think you're inspiring a lot of people by going for it and like like living your dreams and doing things and how. And you talk about this thing of coming to Iceland on a one way ticket. Mm-hmm. Uh, how how were the steps of making making the life you live now real? Like mm. in the beginning, like how, like you said, it's an expensive country. How am I gonna? Yeah. How am I gonna make it here? Yeah, mm. this goes all the way back to my parents. I will say I have to give credit where credit is due, and my family has been entrepreneurial, like all the way to my grand great grandfather, I think. I still remember my mom at some point in my life saying that if I got a normal nine to five, she'd be disappointed. (laughs) (laughs) Good mom. I know. And I had a normal job for like a marketing manager job for two years. And yeah. And honestly, that even that workplace was somewhere where they respected me Mm -hmm. and I could say what I wanted and I could ask for time off. I used to travel. When I had that job, I'd be like, I'd say to my boss, hey, I'm going away for three months. He was like, okay. <laughs> so I don't know how I landed that job. I was, I mean, how did I land it? I went and got it. Like I didn't take no for an answer. And okay, I am trying to give you like a uh, maybe more authentic answer and mm-hmm. more real. One place I remember doing an internship and they treated me like shit. They didn't respect me. They didn't respect my desire for learning and growth. And I walked out on them. Mm -hmm. So I think when a place doesn't support my deep desire, like I I will put my time into things that I will see will benefit my growth immensely. Mm -hmm. So if you're there supporting that journey, I'm with you wholeheartedly. And if you don't respect me, I will be out. Um, I'm going to bounce out. So I have a very strong character. Like I know exactly if I'm not, yeah, definitely if I'm not being respected, Mm -hmm. then I will not tolerate it. Um, But how did the journey go? So so I was entrepreneurial from, hmm, when did it start? My very first job was cleaning cars. So just so everybody knows that, I used to work for my my uncle for all day cleaning cars with my brother and sister and I made $20 Australian for the whole day. And they fed us pizza and I was so thrilled. And I used to save all this money. Oh, it even goes even further back actually. Um, When I was two years old, my mom gave us all money to go to the fair. She gave us $2 each so we could spend it on anything we wanted to. And I um, I ended up watching my brother and my sister spend their money and I saved it. And I was like, that's that was my joy. Mm-hmm. So I have, I don't know where this comes from, but I have a innate entrepreneurial spirit and a, a respect for finances. So that is the basis. My entrepreneurial journey started probably around 17 or 18. I just knew that I was going to make money off like I was going to work online and be location independent and there was no plan B. So I just learned the skills. Was that the main thing to to manage to make a living and being able to be wherever yeah. you wanted to I be? I didn't care if it was a lot of money or a little bit. As long as I could make enough money to cover my expenses working on a laptop, that was the only thing that I was striving for. Mm-hmm. 
I didn't, I did not care about anything else. That laptop and me, that was all I wanted. I, there was, that was the only option, no matter how many years it took. Did you feel this urge to, for traveling yes. early on? Yeah, yeah. I've always been a nomad. Uh-huh. I've always been like very, very, the world is my home for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, when, when people say, where are you from? I don't know how to answer that question. <laughs> yeah, I relate to that. Yeah. But so, so did you feel, did you feel in your essence that Australia, like at some point you were gonna leave Australia and? Hmm. I think so. I think it's just, for me, it was a given. Like, how could you spend your whole life living in one place? Sorry. Good I know point. that's, that's a really point. intense thing because not point. everybody has that opportunity. But for me, even if that, I don't know, I just, there was no, there was no other option. There's no way you could say I will only live in this country and no other country because how will I understand what the world is if I'm only seeing it from the lens of an, of an Australian? Like I cannot understand the world and how it functions if I haven't traveled and, and, and lived in another culture. Mm-hmm. It, to me, it was just like this, especially because I have the opportunity because Australia is not a third world country and I could escape from there. It sounds like I'm escaping a prison. <laughs> but because I knew that was an option because other people had done it before me, I was just going to live an experience somewhere else so I wouldn't be ignorant to how other people live so I could understand cultures. I think I just do things to understand. Mm-hmm. Do you remember the moment when it took off? Like your your content and when you were like okay this is this is going somewhere hmm. i think i remember hitting a hundred thousand and that was a big milestone for me hundred thousand subscribers on youtube mm-hmm. that was a big milestone but i was still not making that much money then How does it work for people if 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 people want to make a living from from just making content? Like, what are the what are the? Because it sometimes seems like you're you're watching somebody who has a lot of followers, mm-hmm. on, but it might not be that easy to monetize it. Well, I don't know if I believe that. Okay. Yeah, I think, and if I was going to do it all over again, I, I'd like to take it from that lens because. That's more relatable, I think. If I was going to do it again, I would really hyper-focus on a very small niche and I'd be very specific about that. Interesting. And I'd create a product myself, not rely on anybody else's, not affiliates, not brand sponsorships. I'd be so hyper-focused on my niche and create a product that would benefit as many people in that niche and then sell that. Because I know people that have, you know, I don't know, 30,000, they had 30,000 YouTube um, subscribers. Um at the start and they were making a lot of money, a lot of money because they created a very, very, very specific product in that niche. So mm-hmm. I know 30,000 is still quite a bit, but yeah, I yeah. think you can still, even though this has been regurgitated a lot, a lot, a thousand true fans theory is very true. Yeah. I don't remember where I read it, if it was Tim Ferriss or somebody who was mm-hmm. talking about being like, it's better to have like thousand yeah. super devoted followers than than... 50,000 followers for that sure. are like Nia. Yeah, yeah. And I can say, I can almost speak from experience for that because I've also have, I have a big audience, but even when I was launching my own products, the conversion rate wasn't huge. So, but it was like, of course, wasn't huge, but it was still significant for my audience size. Mm-hmm. But it's not like the amount of people I had following me, the people that bought was a very small percentage. So even if I had this gigantic, gigantic audience, I'd still only have a small true, like small amount of true fans that would buy. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, and, and it's so much, again, if I was to do it again, I think it would be a lot less mental stress to appeal to a small number of people rather than having millions of people judge me and look at me and take from me and never give back. What is the mental stress of 
being in that situation. Oh my God. <laughs> the fact that you have to ask, it is, everybody's like, No, oh. because I'm curious. Yeah, okay. And I'm really curious. Yeah. And I'm not even a, a big celebrity. Like, I'm not even a celebrity, let's put it that way. But I have a lot of voices. Mm -hmm. Like, it's been a... For humans aren't meant to be exposed to this many opinions and voices, full stop. So the more people you have that are following you, the more voices, opinions, judgments, uh, threats, potential threats you have on your back of like you're gonna slip up. And it's a perfect example. Every, almost every single YouTuber, unless you stick very much to your lane from the very start and you do not change, you do not, do not sway. There's two examples of that that I've seen on YouTube of two women that are very authentic from the start and they do not s stray. They haven't done brand sponsorships. They are so authentic. Mm -hmm. And I think they've created an, an untouchable brand. Okay. The rest... Because, and I'm putting myself in this category, have been swooped up by different opportunities, brands, egos. I've been there, which is stupid to admit, but whatever. Um, and then those YouTubers will always be, will almost always certainly be exposed online and dragged down and torn apart. Because, yeah, right now we have one of the biggest YouTubers on that is being torn to shreds. Who is that? Uh, what's, a, what's her name? Red lipstick girl. I don't know. Uh, uh, torn apart for what? For for being inauthentic? or? I am going to say, and I'm going to get this probably also if people hear this. I don't, I think it's being, it's being blown out of proportion. Mm -hmm. It's when, it's it's just an opportunity for someone to tear, like it's so fast that people can just turn on a, a celebrity so fast, just with a little bit of information that then they blow out of pr proportion. Like this, this YouTuber did something that wasn't right at all. I don't think the intentions were that bad. I think she was really dumb, dumb mm -hmm. with how she approached things. Um, it, I think she was, she needs to learn a mistake, but she's getting like this other person that's now exposing her. And so many people are jumping on the train of exposing her as well. And I haven't watched enough of information on it, so I don't know the full story. It's just so much drama. If people just exerted their energy into something that would change the world instead of uh, drama would be very nice. Like save the whales, for example. Like stop the whaling in Iceland for life. That would be nice. Um, but isn't it in general, like this thing that we started to talk about in the beginning, this this voice that you're talking about, and you follow your, your voice, yeah. you do things... There are so many people that don't do it. And yeah. There is resentment in yeah. so many people. And then you're seeing somebody who is living the life that you would want to live in an alternate universe or yeah. reality and you don't. So it's th there's this small kind of fulfillment of of seeing somebody being oh, taken down. Oh, for sure. People love it. Yeah. Drama. Yeah. We are drama creatures. It's a bit weird. We are. We are. And if people just were satisfied with their own existence and didn't, yeah, maybe weren't resentful, taking into consideration that, yeah, not everybody's going to have a grand, huge life, but can you make it beautiful even in the mundane moments mm -hmm. and not think that, oh, somebody else took my opportunity away from me, therefore I hate them. Therefore exactly. I'm going to be angry at them. Exactly. Like that would be a very different world if we could learn to be satisfied with like watching the leaves blow in the wind and having a meal on our, in, our, in front of us, like a warm meal, instead of, oh, well, I'm not having a five-star meal like this influencer is. But you don't know what's going on in, in the influencer's life either. Like behind the scenes, bleh. That's what I was going to ask you about. When you're talking about the mental stress and you're talking about all these voices, I think so many people that are never put in this position of yeah. people having opinions about you. Mm. Uh, and also the work that goes into it. Yeah. You always, you only see the output. You don't see the journey. You don't see the, and I, the, the more people that I've interviewed, I've interviewed people that have done so beautiful and great things. Mm. The more I see, I, I take it as a given that that person has worked their ass off. Mm. There's been a, a lot of tears. There's been a lot of stress. There's been a, but you don't see that. No. 
And it, yeah, it's so easy. Oh, you're just an influencer. You're just a YouTuber. <laughs> you, I, no, I'm a director, videographer, photographer, script writer, um, travel agent, like the the, the therapist, uh, st- uh, boss, accountant. Like, and you put yourself out there. And you do put yourself out there. Yeah. Which is maybe the most difficult thing. I mean, yeah. if you look at, like, I think I saw somewhere that even even just having a lecture in front of people comes close to the fear of dying yeah. for most people. Yeah. So putting yourself fully out there and being vulnerable, it's uh, it's more than saying it. Yeah. People are, and nobody ever, there's, there's a 0% chance that 100% of people will like you. Like people Good are point. just, <laughs> <laughs> and this is the, I, finally, I think I'm coming to the point where I'm really, like I know that, know it, but I don't, integrate it into my being. I think I think it's so human and normal to to actually be able to live like other people's opinions kind of don't they don't even register. I there's only a handful of people if that that I know that are really living that place. Yeah. That's, it's a hard that's difficult. place. <laughs> It's a really difficult place. I think maybe we're also wired for that. It has to be. We have to be wired for that because it also meant safety. Because if you're excluded from the tribe, it means danger. Exactly. So we have to consider what other people are thinking. And when you have millions of voices, it gets really tiring. And you know, I think our, our brain is hardwired to to save us from danger. Yeah. So as soon as there's a threat or like yeah. a negative voice, the, you, you really have to train yourself to to like take the positive voices in and let the negative voices just yeah. brush easily off you. I think exactly. it's a, it doesn't come naturally to human beings because our brain is hardwired to protect us. Yeah, exactly. And I will say now that when I receive negative opinions, it doesn't affect me very, like hardly at all, which is nice. I say that, but I'm not was 100% there, sure. Was, was, there a t- fir- was there a time and point where, where yeah. it did? Where, yes, exactly. I was going to say when I first started YouTube and I started getting, when you first start a channel, everybody's really supportive because they find you little niche YouTuber. You're like, oh my God, I love your work. Yes, I found this underground YouTuber. And then they, you grow and then people start having opinions. You start attracting haters because the more you grow, the more like the more people love you, the more you're going to find an equal amount of people that hate you. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like it, the, the bigger you are, the more hate you're going to receive full stop. And yeah, the first few times when I... <laughs> first year or two when I was getting negative comments, there was a lot that would make me cry, like a lot. And I became self-conscious over them. I honestly, I'm looking forward to a time when there's a study on YouTubers influences and how damaging this is to our brains, Mm -hmm. because I think it really is. I I think I've had permanent damage from this career. Um, Now I start to think if I have that damage too. Because I've I've been in the spotlight for many many years in this small country, and I yeah. just sometimes feel like if I would not have taken that yeah. route, I think my brain uh, my brain function would be different. Yeah, I think definitely. I don't even know what my brain would look like anymore without having so many voices. Even my friend picked up on it the other day. I spoke to him, and I was justifying on a phone call to him. I've known him for seventeen years, half of my life, and I was on the phone call justifying something. And he was like, Hey, do you have invisible conversations with, no, do you have conversations with invisible people? Um, trying to justify a point. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> cause I, it's almost like a default now that I have to defend myself or justify why I'm doing something because somebody's going to come and attack me. Yeah. <laughs> it's so dumb. So mm-hmm. now I'm trying to break that habit. Like if you don't like me, whatever. But yeah, then with years of being on YouTube after a while, it was almost therapy because now only the things that upset me, I know, like things that upset me, generally there's two options. One, for a split second, you're upset. Like, this is an injustice. They don't see me for who I actually am. And I wish I could correct their opinion. You get over that pretty fast. Or the second option is that there's truth to it and you actually have to work through it. Mm-hmm. So it's a trigger for a reason. True. So I've used it as uh, therapy. <laughs> When people come to me with certain things, I'm like, let me look at it. And then I'll work through it. And then the, the trigger disappears. I don't care if people say it because I'll either agree with them and be like, actually, you know what? It is something I do. 
and I am a, in that area, I'm not a great person and mm -hmm. that's it. Or can I change it because I don't like it about myself? But is there any way of, uh, I've thought a lot about it. Is there any way of being a content creator without being a content consumer? That is, is it possible to be working on something like you're doing without seeing the negative? Like, isn't that almost inevitable that you are going to see I think so. The comment sections or what somebody is. I'm just yeah. thinking about, I, I've, I've listened a lot, for example, to Joe Rogan when he's talking about people and they are talking about these negative voices and these negative, and he's like, yeah. dude, you shouldn't read it. Dude, you shouldn't read it. Yeah. But I think it's almost inevitable. Well, it's on your platform. So you're going to read it. Exactly. And then if you're bigger, then it's going to hit the news websites. But I do like, like Kim Kardashian, for example, I've read that she spends maybe half an hour on Instagram a day. She'll upload and then get off. Exactly. And she doesn't care. And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> so I think they have somehow figured it out. I think they're too busy. They are too busy to read anything. True. And then there's also smart uh, creators. And I would not put myself in this category because I talk too much and I share way too much of my life that just stick to a niche so much and they are just one very... Uh, one tiny version of who they are mm -hmm. online. So, and they're like polished and cute and nice and loving. Yeah. And they do everything so well, really not offensive. You can't hate them. You literally can't dislike them. There's nothing that they're showing that would make you dislike them. So the comment section is going to be really nice because they're just, yeah. There's Icelandic influencers that do it really, really, really well. Yeah. What do you think about this? like showing how much of yourself you show on social media or in general, like, because in, in my, there is like, in my view, we are almost always, even if people want to be authentic, they want to be vulnerable. The tendency is always you're, you're showing the, the nice side of you. You're showing yeah. the, like, and, and that's what I think skews our brains in this age of social media mm. is we are all, all almost always only seeing a part of other people and we are never seeing their true shadows, their true. And then we are comparing our shadows to the, to the beautiful image of other people. Well, it's a beautiful representation of how afraid society is of the shadows of humanity. Exactly. No one wants to see that side. If you show it on social media, just, to give the background, if you show the true nature of a person, they tell you, oh, get therapy, get help. Why are you crying on social media? Why are you doing this? Like, oh, I thought you're nice. So they don't really want to see it. And then they complain, oh, but we only see one version of you on social media. Exactly. It's like, because people are afraid of shadows. They're afraid of their own shadow. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to welcome influencers' shadows either. Because if you saw the reality of People, I don't know, I've, I'm only learning that I think people really are, most people default to sadness and most people aren't happy. So why would you follow anybody that's a reflection of, like, why, you wouldn't want to follow someone sad. You want to follow someone that shows you maybe there's a different way. Maybe I don't have to be like this. But I think there is... A uh, growing uh, amount of people who are maybe on a really difficult journey mm -hmm. for a period of time, mm -hmm. uh, facing their own shadows mm -hmm. fully, yeah. and they really love it when they see somebody they have followed on social media who is actually, whoa, I'm not alone in this. Yes, and they don't, I don't know. I'm like, you don't agree? I'm torn by this because, again, if you show it too much, I think they'll be like, oh, okay, we get it already. Do you have an example of yourself? Like, Yeah. Get, getting getting negative response when you were just being authentic. Yeah, I do that. Like, But I pull people up on it now. Like I accidentally jumped on a live the other day and I started crying. It was it came out of nowhere. I'm pretty authentic when it comes to most things. And then someone was like, why are you crying? Get off and get help. And I, and I just like, I was deep in sadness. And I was like, wait, why are you telling me what to do? Like I'm showing you the vulnerability right now and you're telling me what to do and how I should process my emotions. Like this is authentic me in this moment. Um so I do have people judging that and myself, like I've been going through three years now 
of pain and I get bored of myself talking about this. <laughs> like, I don't want to talk about it. So I will myself not put this stuff out because I don't want my image to be three years of sadness. Of course not. That's so, that's not representative of who my soul is. Yes, my soul is going through a three-year really big struggle period. It doesn't mean who I am. That's who I am. Mm -hmm. But that's that's so interesting when you're saying it because that, that's what I deal with a lot of the time myself is even, even I, I had a period earlier this year where mm. I was doing interviews and I was so depressed. Yeah. It was so difficult and I was judging myself so much instead of thinking, okay, but if it's three months, okay, if it's four months, if it's five months, how about you start starting to talk about it? Yeah. And if people don't want to listen, okay, fair you're, it's a free world. Yeah. You can stop listening. But I, I realized I was judging myself so much. Mm, interesting. You, you never know. You never know who really needs that message at that point. Yeah, that's true. I have and, been at yeah. a point where I was listening to some someone else's podcast, and they shared that part of themselves, mm -hmm. and I was not thinking, ah, he's been sad for four years. I was just, wow, that resonated with me right now. Oh, I like that. That's true. And I guess people that are not interested in the dark journey that you're going through then they, yeah, you, they don't have to listen and they can listen to somebody else. But how about, how, how is that, for example, I'm thinking somebody who is in a way living their their dream life, like, like you have been, mm -hmm. like you're traveling all over, you have a lot of followers, you're making good money. If you don't feel good, you start to judge yourself because you're like, it's one thing to feel bad and you know it's because my salary is bad. It's because yeah. I haven't traveled for a long time. It's because, but it's like, I'm living this beautiful life and I'm still sad. Mm -hmm. That's at least in, for me, that's when I start to judge myself. That's true. I've had judgments. I'm not, I'm not allowed to feel like this at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> and yet we have suicide rappers, like the most famous people in the world kill themselves. Exactly. <laughs> suicide rappers, rappers. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, there is, oh my God, that judgment. And then judgment from other people. Oh yeah. You, you, you don't understand my pain. You can't be sad. Look at your life. And it's like, you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. What is going on behind the scenes? They can't comment. <laughs> 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 no, but <clears throat> yeah, that's a, that's an outdated idea as well. Like, yeah, I, I love it. Cause I'm going to look back on this interview and I'm going to see such a, such a like, sad version of me and hopefully I can reflect back and be like, yay, she she's grown. And I wanted to capture this for that, not just for this reason, because also it's a big milestone period for me. But you don't, you, I don't know, you, you don't seem, you, I don't don't, seem you, don't, you don't strike me as sad. Oh, wow. That's nice. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. I like that. Maybe, you know, because for ages I had this mask. I think if you had me here a year or two ago, I'd probably be sitting up uh, very professional, like smiling even more, really bubbly. Everything's great. Everything's really good. Ah. Like that was me. Exactly. But now, I don't care. <laughs> yeah, because you were, you were talking about it earlier, this thing of living your life or integrating it fully, that you're actually living it, that negative things are not registering. I, I, in, yeah. in my view, I think you have to, that, that you have to live through the time like if you're sharing your masks mm. and I'm, I have been doing it in the last two years and mm. I'm still doing it. You have to go through a period where you're, you feel like oh, I'm, I'm too much down. I'm too sad, but mm. that you are also at the same time becoming more authentic. Yeah, I think so. Like what you were saying earlier about you coming here and like, yeah, now I'm, I'm not sad. I'm feeling, but, I, but I, do I have a mask on? Yeah. That, that version definitely had a huge mask on. Yeah. Which yeah. brings me to this concept, free, free human yeah. that you've been talking a lot about. Yeah. What is it to be a free human? And That's the journey I'm trying to figure out. Because when I was at the peak of my, whoops, hello, stay, thank you. When I was at the peak of my material success, I felt the most trapped. So it's not finances. Okay. Yeah. And a lot of people think, oh, if only I had the money, then I'd be free. Mm -hmm. That's not That's not it. I know that money does help, mind you, especially, it depends on, on your situation. Like, I know that a nice passport helps 
Like if you can't escape your country, I know that that will help. I know that all these things will definitely help. Like if I had to work a normal job, I don't know, maybe I'd enjoy it. <laughs> maybe I'd enjoy mm. it because, mm. you know, this job is really hard. You never have an off switch. You're always working. Um, so I decided to, initially I thought I was free and I've made a lot of content of like, look at me, I'm free, free human. How I got free and then progressively I'm starting to see I'm still not free and I'm even more trapped right now. And I think I'm start, I have this right at this moment, I'm a little bit repelled against the idea of being a free human because I feel so trapped still right now that for me to promote free human is painful because I so feel so unfree. And then I'm putting out this message of like, you know, chase freedom, but it is really hard to do that. Mm-hmm. D- depending on your circumstances, but free, I, like, I I am trying to figure out what freedom. But means. isn't isn't it always because you're talking about the financial? Th- I I and I think the good thing about having decent finances is mm-hmm. then you don't have to. First of all, you don't have to worry about finances, which might be the biggest stressor for most people. Mm-hmm. And you can actually do things, like for example, if if you need to travel somewhere and mm-hmm. take a this expense, you can't do it. Yeah. If you need to go on a retreat, you can't do it. Yep. You can't do th- so, so I, th- I think there's certain things that if you don't have money. Yeah. It, what I think that money does provide you is the capacity to um, do the work that you need in order to be a free human. What I do think, and I'm, I, I'm trying to get glimpses of it. I think freedom is internal. That's what it is. Like the, book by Victor E. Frankl, uh, Man's Search for Meaning, is the guiding light for me because he was in a concentration camp and he was free. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the most beautiful books ever. Yeah, so I know that that's what freedom is. I'm not there because the internal freedom is the hardest freedom to get. And what having finances does is freeze up your time so you don't have to be in survival mode all the time in order to go on the journey of figuring out like yourself and you're in a landscape in order to navigate you back to freedom. So that also then means that no matter what the circumstances you are in, you are free because no one can, no one can control you no mm-hmm. matter what, even if, they're, if, if they've completely trapped you. So that's definitely can be granted by finances for sure. Is it exclusive that money will give you that freedom? To explore? No, there's other ways. And, and it's not like, I don't, I just don't like the idea that people say, well, you've got this, so I can't do it. So they go on the couch and they listen to Netflix and they're like, I'm done. My life is over. It's like, if you wanted to pursue it, you wouldn't watch Netflix. 100%. And, and I know that, you know, and this is me justifying, like watch, watch me just go in this little loop now. And people like say, well, I have, or somebody I know has three jobs. They don't even have time to watch Netflix. So what about them? And what they're doing in that moment is saying, but what about them? So they dismiss the door, the, the door for themselves because it's easier to defend somebody else than to look at themselves. Again, like it's a constant dodging and I see it all the time. People will come up with every excuse under the sun to justify why I'm wrong and they are right. I Instead actually of taking the fucking time to do the work on themselves. 100%. And I actually think the person who, the person who would actually be doing three jobs and working hard they will be looking at somebody like you and say, hey, maybe I can pick up something. But the person who's talking about the person with three, oh, <laughs> three jobs insane. is actually the lazy person. Oh my God, I I, I put out, I, this is where the downfall of my YouTube for it, it was a small one. I've had a few people, like a, f- a few attacks on my YouTube. This was one that I just, I was so, I was so perplexed by what was going on because I put out this video, uh, 20, fuck it. three things to do before you're in your twenties or something like that, or before you're 30. And I just said, you know, one of them was, uh, explore the world. Um, don't, don't just take any job and get stuck in the job. Like there was, I I even forget what I did, but the thing that stands out for me was there was a comment from a white chick, my age. And she said, oh, it's easy for you to say, but what about the black people or people of color that are experiencing this, this pain and they cannot um, go on this journey of, you know, not having a job or not doing this. And I was like, 
So you're sitting here telling me I'm privileged, which I am. Thank you very much for pointing it out every single person on the internet. Um, and she was defending them while she was in the exact position as me and she could do exactly what I was doing, but she was defending someone that she doesn't even know to make a point to hate me. And it just it you, my, fucking my, annoys me so much. Like you're literally, if my you freed is bla- yourself. My girlfriend is black. She's yeah. from Africa. And she hates when people like that are talking on yeah. her behalf. Okay. That makes like, me happy. Please, please don't do it. It's almost the default. It's like, well, you can say it, but you're privileged because you're white. What about people of color? It's like, well, you're white. <laughs> and who was asking you to talk on their behalf? Yeah, that's true. I never thought of that. But it's just, it's, and, and there is consideration. Like I have consideration. I see systematic racism. I, I do believe that there is an element of that for sure. Anyway, that's going into politics that I'm <laughs> not so sure I'm ready for. But what annoys me is that people, like if people took care of their own fucking business and they took out care of their own fucking life, guess what happens? You free yourself to make change that you want to see in the world. 100%. Instead of defending the position of other people, you are the one that will make a contribution to the world. Instead of, yeah, instead of blaming others that aren't doing the job that they should be doing. Yeah, it's ah. a very interesting thing. It's and I and I, I don't know. In from if I would be hiring people, for example, mm. and if I would go on somebody's social media and see this is a person who's talking badly about people who are actually doing something. I would never hire that person. Oh, wow. Yay. <laughs> no, no, because it's so obvious that you are, you're stuck in the wrong energy. Oh, I love that. Yeah, you want output, not complaining. Exactly. Yeah. But this thing about being free, because we talked about the finance, I, I, I think it's, it's like you talked about Viktor Frankl, and it's, it's innate in human nature to, to, I don't know, there is this, if you could call it this existential, there is always this existential, I don't know if I should call it dread or this existential thing that's always there. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't leave you. For a lot of people, as long as you can just think, when I will have that, then it's going to be better. Yeah. Or when I'm going to have that job or when, and uh, you could call it like the daydream. Mm -hmm. When I will write my book, Mm -hmm. when I will do my thing. Yeah. And you actually never start doing it. And then you can kind of justify this, uh, this existential feeling. Existential dread. Yeah. Because it's going to, sometime later I'm going to get, but if you actually do things like you're doing and you're going through layers of yourself and then you're at the point where I've, I've tried to travel all over. Mm-hmm. I've tried getting paid for the things that I love. I've tried having a lot of money. That's when you actually are left with only that feeling. And you're like, what is this thing that I'm dealing with? Yeah. Yeah. I know that feeling. That's pretty profound right there. That's what I've been dealing with this whole year. Like, it is there, but what is it? And I think a lot of people are feeling it. Yeah, I spoke to my therapist the other day and I was daydreaming of this chapter of my life being over. I was like, when I'm out of this chapter, then I'm excited to live She was like, hey, Sorel, you're alive right now. Mm -hmm. Don't wish your life away. And... The small things. And it is Being grateful for the small things. And I honestly, I will say that it's so hard to do when you're in a rut. But another friend, my friend, uh, he just... And this is what I'm now leaning on, especially during the hard times you need to take care of your body. Like there's so many big lessons I'm learning right now. If you don't sleep enough hours, then you can't get enough nutrients in your body because your body can't break down the food that you're eating. So therefore your mind is compromised. You don't function properly. You don't think properly. You don't have clarity. You don't have ideas coming through because you're not sleeping properly. So, and that's just one aspect of the fact, like if you don't get into nature and connect with nature, then you're not being grounded. If you don't um, meditate, then your mind's like running away. Like there's two, there's 
highest states, I forget what it is, highest vibrations is like, or the most optimal vibrational states is when you can meditate and drop yourself into that meditation zone or orgasms or laughter. Like these are these three states. So if you're not doing things to assist your vehicle, this physical vehicle in functioning, you're going to spiral down so bad. So you just have to come back to the basics. Like as hard as it is, like, did you go, did you wake up? Did you sleep properly? Are you really dedicating the time? Especially if you're going through a tough time, like you have to sleep more when it's a traumatic event. Are you giving yourself that time? 100%. The more, I don't know, I don't know if I'm just talking out of my ass now, but I feel like the frequency, the freak, the frequency in the world in general is just going up. Yes, it's I feel going up. that. It's going up. And the, the with COVID and everything, like all of the dark things are bubbling on the surface. Yeah. We are getting to know the systems more. We yeah. are seeing the flaws of the system. And, and if you're actually going to be able to connect with yourself and have higher frequency within you, you have mm. to take care of your portal, like what you're talking about, yeah. your body. And if that means, I, I have been feeling it recently, Usually I'm like, okay, I take my sleep seriously, but it's, I'm good on seven and a half or eight hours. Recently it's been, I feel very different if I up it to nine hours. Yeah. Okay. Nice. And then my body is just telling me now I need nine hours. Yeah. Maybe I'm not sleeping the whole time, but I should aim for nine hours in bed. Mm -hmm. And if that's what I need now, then I should listen to it. Yeah. Don't be like, no, I should only need eight. Yeah. And I feel like whoever's listening to this will resonate with this. Not everybody's in the same frequency of what we're going through. But I do think we are going collectively through a really big trauma event right now. Like COVID was the start of that. Mm -hmm. And we need to take care of ourselves so much right now because I do think things are bubbling up to the surface and I feel like we're all about to pop. I don't know what the pop is going to look like yet. It could be the, it could be the destruction of the monetary system. It could be... Um, destruction of the food chain. It could be another pandemic. It could be anything, but I think we're about to pop. Like you cannot sustain this amount of like, it's so, we're so volatile right now. That's why people are on edge. That's why people are so deeply unhappy, deeply to the core unhappy. And I think the, there's, there's two options here, I think because I'm the clairvoyant and I predict the future. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but there could be two options. One, we pop and then we deal with the consequences of the pop, whatever that looks like. And the second one is that we realize that we're about to pop and we take that tension out of our own system, which will collectively lower the rest of the tension. And if everybody decides to calm themselves and look after their portal, portal sleep well, and decrease the tension that's within our own bodies, then we're going to lower the collective frequency of this tension in the air. I love how you're putting it. And I then really we might have a chance it. to not have a gigantic pop that's going to disrupt us again for years and years. Like COVID is going to fuck us up already for years. It already has and it already will continue to. Mm -hmm. People will never, like a lot of people will never recover from that. Mm -hmm. And now we still have something that's about to pop. And how cool that the earth shaking and the volcano that's happening again. I feel like that's a representation as well. Yeah, there's something, there's something really, uh, I, I really, I really resonate with what you're saying. Hmm. Like there's something in the collective frequency that's just boiling up. And, and I think uh, you said not everybody's feeling it. Of course not. There are, and, and that for me is, al there are alternate realities going yeah. on at the same time. hundred yes. percent. Yeah. People are, because there's some people have already done the work like this again, <laughs> a few options, but some people have realized that like they were broken and unhealed. So they unplugged themselves from a false reality that they were living and they're fine. Like their tension is mm -hmm. already down. And then there's other people that cannot face the fact. They're like, no, 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 no. I can't look after myself. Mm -hmm. I need to hustle. I have another friend like this. Hustle, grind. Life is not a game. I'm like, no, life is a game. <laughs> and it's just more and more. I need to succeed, succeed, succeed. And that's also their reality. There's a lot of realities going on at the same time. One thing that comes to me now when you were saying that is there's been a lot of talk about the feminine and the masculine. Mm -hmm. And this thing you're saying, like if each and every person is taking better care of themselves mm -hmm. to lower their stress levels, lower that thing that that's not going to make you pop, that's actually you injecting more feminine into mm -hmm. your life. And so, we need that. So in my view, instead of 
pitting women and men against each other. Yeah. It's like both men and women need more feminine yes. energy. Yes. That's what we're going through though. That's I think that's the core of what's happening in the world is the shift from the masculine energy into the feminine. And as you said, m- both men and women have those energies within us. It's not ma- uh, a guy versus a girl. It's feminine energy, which is like care, love, mm-hmm. also wild, chaotic, not being okay with seeing so much corruption in the world. So I think that is, for me, I see like that's what's going on in the collective narrative is that we've gone from a system, like the political system's a joke right now. I mean, come it's on. A, yeah, everybody start. I mean, I'm not going to say it, but most people are starting to see it. I like think. it's so, <laughs> it's it, they're joke. clowns. Now we get to see, now we get, and it's so fun that I've seen this for a while. I hate the political system. I always, since I was maybe like 11, I always thought, why are we voting for Dama Dama? That's our options. <laughs> That's our options. Are you kidding? And now to hear so many people see that as well, but I think not to the point of like, oh, that's just politics. They're like, wait a minute. What? These clowns are running my country? Everybody hates politicians. Rightfully so, because they've deceived us for so long. The problem is, again, for me, with the system, like I know good people that have become ministers in this country and I see them change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because... How they are you gonna? To. How are you gonna be able to be authentic and get to the top? Mm-hmm. It ain't gonna work. You have to start to, okay, I'm gonna light just a little bit here, yeah. and then a little bit here, yeah. and then a little bit more, and in the end, you're just a totally different person. Yeah, I was seeing it the other day when they had the the conference here with all the all the world leaders coming mm-hmm. and and. They were stopping the traffic everywhere. And yeah. it's just, what, a, what is this? Like this show, I saw them as well. I was going to Westman Islands or I was coming back and there was like police surrounding them. Like, me, 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 all these fancy cars and vans. And I was like, what an idiotic show to show us that they are more important than we are. Yeah, no, some, they're not. Exactly. <laughs> they are working for us, except they're not anymore. And they haven't ever. It was like the way that they've set up the political system is pretending that they work for us, but they've never worked for us. Hundred percent. And I, and, and I, I'm, I, what I'm often thinking is, because I worked as a journalist for for years, I'm thinking, was I, was I like the mainstream media are now? Ah. I, I would like to believe that I was different, but was I that brainwashed? What like, do you think? I think, in my view, having been on the other side. We all have egos. What happens if you're a young person, you get into the media, maybe you work as a media person on TV. Mm -hmm. You have to be a really, really strong character to Mm -hmm. not give any discount of your values. And I think the main thing is uh, uh, your brain is clever and it knows you should do this, 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 this. If you don't do it, you're going to get fired. Mm -hmm. So you start to self-censor. Oh, that's the worst part. That's the way that I see it. You start to self-censor. And um, yeah, but I'm just thinking now with, with, with the COVID thing, I would like to believe that they went so far that it's actually the greatest catalyst that we have ever seen mm-hmm. because it's becoming, they are exposing everything with going too far. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was a gift in disguise. They thought that they were being clever, but I think they just shot themselves in the butthole. <laughs> yeah. I, but we're going to see a power struggle. Like that, you can see it now. They're like, uh, 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 no, you listen to us. We are the authority. <laughs> but that's why there's like people like Robert Kennedy Jr., for example, coming through. And you know, he doesn't, he doesn't feel like he's above you. Yeah, I, lo- I, lo- I love his message. He's just like, no, we're doing this together. And it's and I'm so excited for people to realize that we're all human and there's no one above one another. Like But how how, how do you see how how I thought a lot about if if this is what's really going on, what we are talking about yeah. here. These systems, they don't they are not gonna give up so easily. Exactly. So, so we might be heading into a time of even more turbulence. Yes. For a while. Yes. Before it gets better. Yes. And Like, I don't like to see myself, 
I coined this term. I talked to myself a lot. And there was one thing I, I said, I was like, I'm not, the only thing I'm anti is I'm anti-important. Now, let me explain that because I haven't thought this through and I've never said it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> anti-important as in I'm not important, you're not important. We as a collective have a job that needs to be um, done as humanity. And what our job is in humanity right now, if we look at the timeline of the world, the timeline that we all have to go through right now is pain and sacrifice and turmoil in order for future generations to benefit. Like just, we will have to, we are going through a time where things are going to collapse because they're so inauthentic and not in alignment anymore. They, they serve to serve a purpose for a while and they need it to happen, but they are so outdated. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need the feminine energy now of care, of love, of respect for mother nature, because we are mother nature. Mm -hmm. We cannot be killing whales. They are some of the smartest creatures on the in the world and we are killing them. It's fucked up. We cannot continue like this and we know we can't, but there's just a few people in power that are not going to give up the reins because there's money involved and there's shareholders at stake or whatever. They just want their money. We cannot continue. And the price that as a collective, as the world we have to pay, and it's not because any of us have done anything wrong. It's because it's our job right now to be part of this collapse in order for our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren to benefit from a world that's more in integrity. Amen. It's going to suck, but it's going to be better for our future if we allow this, this collapse to happen. And also maybe it doesn't have to suck too much if, if you really integrate. Yeah. Yeah. If we What like, is going to happen and you integrate, okay, this is the time period where I just have to really, really take care of myself, be nice to my people. And maybe if you know a little bit what's coming, mm -hmm. I don't know, it doesn't have to be too bad. Maybe, yeah. maybe actually what you're talking about, maybe the worst period is before everything pops. Yeah, actually Because right. that's, that's a very stressful period. There's a lot of people who are feeling the tension, but when actually there is something, something happens, okay, maybe then it's, I don't know, maybe then it's going to be a little bit more, okay, this least, is what I've been feeling. Yeah. And I heard a crisis manager um, say to me that even if you deliver bad news to someone, that's better than no news because at least they know what to do. Yeah. They can, prob they can solve problems. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this now, what we're going through, the tension stage is like, what's coming, what's coming, what's coming? And then when we when it drops, we'll be like, oh, let's problem solve. And you're right. We like we know what, we can have an idea of what's coming. Um, so yeah, leaning on community, simplifying your life, dropping your ego, doing the healing, taking care of yourself, decreasing the tension in your body. And that's what I said before. I think maybe the pop doesn't have to be so significant if... The majority of, excuse me, it bipped. If the majority of people realize that there's so much tension in them, and they decrease the that stress, mm -hmm. maybe we can just collectively actually get through this the right way. I think so. That'd be nice. I think so, because I think uh, it it doesn't. I don't know. There's a critical mass. Like you only need a critical mm -hmm. mass of people to to accelerate a certain amount for it to affect everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, that's also the exciting thing. I think so there's a statistic and I forget what it is. That's great. But maybe it's like 15% of people have to have a make, make a change and then it just ripples out into society. I think it's like also like the hundred monkey syndrome, um, that theory, but... What about now? Now I'm now I'm getting really wooey wooey. Let's do it. <laughs> I like it. So if it because I what I've been thinking about a lot this year is there, there was this point. If if you talk about first density consciousness, mm -hmm. second density consciousness, and then there's this evolutionary jump into human beings. We are the first species that actually go to enjoy the sunset. We are aware mm -hmm. of our being here. Mm -hmm. How? 
is it going to look when we go from the third density to the fourth density? And might that be happening as we speak? Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> uh. Because I feel like there's so much acceleration going on right now. Yeah, there is. In the collective. Actually, let's talk about the positives. Because I think a lot of people are probably watching this like, we're about to pop, we're all doomed. <laughs> but it's always the darkest before the dawn. Yeah, 100%. And I've never seen the, the I grew up with a mom that thinks very different. And she's been saying certain things for a very long time. And I used to not be able to say any of these things to people that I believe as well. I was like, There's, I can't share this information because they're going to think I'm fucking insane. And now I hear a lot of this around and I'm not alone anymore. And my mom said that when she was growing up 50s, in the 50s, 60s, she felt like the most alone person in the world. Mm -hmm. And now she has a global community of people that think like her and are seeing what she's seeing. And same with me, my friends, the people I surround myself, if they don't understand, they at least accept my truth. And, but there's a lot of people that's th that fully and wholeheartedly see what I see. Also to the point that a lot of my friends are connected with mega celebrities, mega, the biggest pop stars in the world, and they are feeling it. Mm -hmm. And so they, two of them in particular, are literally changing their entire career structure in order to make sure that they put out art that is of a higher vibration. Mm -hmm. So these conversations are being had. I'm vibrating right now. That's cool. Whoa. These conversations are being had by people around the world at the top. Like Joe Rogan, for example, lots of people hate him, but he's having very important conversations. Very and important. he's the most important, important and most influential person in the media right now. So we are seeing this really valuable information coming to the surface. Mm -hmm. And there. It's, it is actually critical mass. You know, now that I think of it, I don't think there's any, there's no stopping it. No. And so many of these people come from a place of love and light and they actually mean it. Doesn't mean that they're always like love and light. It means that they are badasses, but the message is love. Like the core of their message is unity and love and a higher frequency. Mm -hmm. So we are there. And that's why it's so uncomfortable for the lower density people that are trying to hold us back in the dark ages. We have to evolve and we are evolving to a place where love is going to be the default and the frequency that we are striving for is higher. So what does the next dimension of human look like? There's going to be, I think there's going to be a divide of people that think that this is still bullshit and they're going to live in their little bubble. I think there might be a split of civilizations, maybe, mm -hmm. of people that are like, mm, I'm not, I'm not playing in your world. And the cool thing is that I don't, like if your frequency changes so much, like I genuinely am not affected. I just, I don't listen to the media. I don't understand. I don't care about politics. They don't influence me. And they, and it's fun to finally realize that they think they have everybody and they're in control of everybody that system, but there's people that to them, it's just like a little, it's like a mosquito. It's like, ugh, get away. Like we are so unaffected by them and they used to have full control over us, just like the church used to have full control over people. Now it's just like, oh, these annoying little pests, I'll deal with them no, I mean, on you the mentioned, side. You mentioned Joe Rogan earlier. Yeah. He is getting, I think he's getting around 10 times the, yeah. the, the audience that CNN has, for example. <laughs> yeah, it's dead. They're dead. Yeah. They're completely gone. So I think it's a really like... I think the people that control the mainstream media, they are underestimating how many people have already said goodbye to them. Oh, yeah. Oh, I don't think they're under, uh, underestimating that their, their bottom line is probably going to shit. <laughs> 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 so they're like, oh, no, what's happening? More turn up the fear in the, in the media. And it's like, we've, we, we can see. We see what you're doing now. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> it's, becoming, it's becoming too obvious. It's so obvious now. And yeah, that's the exciting part I think about all this is that we are so like, it's not even, we're not even fighting against the old system. It's just like, oh, please. Yeah, it's just, for me, it's, for me, the main thing is how is it going to look like? How is it going to look like if we have a different monetary system? How is it going to look like if we have a, I don't know, the, the, the systems that might have to collapse? Yeah. How is it going to look like? Yeah. I. But then again, that's masculine 
how, 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 instead of allowing and saying, okay, like. Yeah. I heard someone say that um, before it was very much like individual success. Like I will succeed. And now it's community success that we're Mm -hmm. leaning into. So there's lots of speculations about what the future might look like, but I see it as a lot softer. I see it as a yeah. lot because no one we can't survive with that tension and that pressure. You know, like you said, you were talking about your friend earlier. This, this, like, I have to, I have to do this. I have to. Uh, th- this is what killed my health. Yeah. For example, like same. <laughs> like, and and then you realize, like, what what is this? If you're always in that energy. Like I have to, I have to, I have to, you're, you're just not allowing for the things that the universe might want you to have Yeah. because you're in, you're like in so much resistance mode and. You know, opening up yourself to the potential extra gifts. I think that's the time we are, we are like the, the time of, for example, not resting your body. Mm -hmm. Why would you not rest your body if you feel like that's the most important thing in your life? I still struggle with that. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) I'm like, if I spend half a day not doing anything, I'm like, oh my God. I realized just when I, when I, when I said it, I realized the same thing. I'm still (laughs) struggling with it, but at least I'm very conscious of it. Yeah. And I'm I'm making an effort too, and I'm realizing that might be the most important thing in my life right now is yeah. to rest. Yeah, rest, and for me, is figuring out what brings me joy. Yeah, joy too, joy too. For example, I didn't know how hard it would be for me to figure this out because I was a hustle baby as well. So everything was about output and results. Like everything was mm-hmm. about results. I didn't have hobbies unless they were monetizable. Mm-hmm. So. Stupid. Now you're into the you're you're, you're into the music. Is, yeah. Uh, is that giving you joy because it's something like new and something that's challenging you? And I want to think about this answer. Hmm. It is equally providing me joy and petrifying me at the same time, which is why I'm very excited to be doing this because it is so uncomfortable for me. And it's weird that I put so much pressure on myself for 22 years about this. And now that it's happening, I'm like, wow, this is way easier than I thought it was going to (laughs) be. And the mental turmoil leading up to when I finished recording this album to now, which is almost a year, um, like this journey has been more exhausting than just putting it out in the world and just doing the steps. Um, yeah, it is. It's very, it's, it's really challenging. It's a brand new direction, but I think the biggest excitement for me and is that it is returning to art, which I'm just so grateful for that I get to do something because art really, it doesn't, art doesn't make sense. Art, but it brings me joy. Mm -hmm. And I went really off track for a while. I really went off track. And the, the the greatest thing is that there's absolutely no money in this. There's no money at all. And I don't think it's going to be successful financially at all. And I am, it's, it's scary because it's like putting, you know, the safe path was to continue building my business and more products and monetizing more. And instead I pulled the plug out of all of it. I was like, psych, just kidding. And I turned to something that might, make me into a starving artist. <laughs> I don't know. Mm-hmm. And there's uh, there's a level of joy in that as well, is that I'm not willing to sacrifice my heart for, for money anymore. Mm-hmm. And also this, uh, I just, when I saw you and you're, you're starting to make music and you're diving in, I realized with myself, it's been a while since I, since I allowed me to start to do something that I'm maybe not good at. Yeah. And really go there. And because it's talking about the body, like the, I think it does something to the neurology of the brain to be, to be new at something. Yeah. It's so fun. Yeah. It's so fun. You are the student again and you're just yeah. absorbing and you, you are dumb. You go into the room of producers and they're like, just do this. You're like, what, sorry, what, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> and so then you absorb you're like, and you know, even just the steps of how to release music. I'm like, okay, you have to have 
a distributor and you have to have like your channels whitelisted and you have to have a press release and you have to have all these things. And I'm like, whoa, like all the steps to actually release music, how to make a music video that is interesting. Like there's, there's a lot to this world. And it's fun. That's not even on top of the fact of like, how do you have uh, vocal control when singing into a microphone? Mm-hmm. That's a whole different ball game as well. Like, make sure that you don't say certain letters because it doesn't sound good in in music. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, what? <laughs> All of these things that when I first was like, I want to make music, this enormous plate is just this world that you know nothing about and you think there's no way you would ever learn anything. But teeny tiny steps will just unlock things. Mm-hmm. And... I could have done this on the side and never put it out and could have done it for joy. But unfortunately, I still think that I, I need to, in order for me to learn, I have to have the pressures from the external world. <laughs> so I'm not That's yet- a good point. Yeah, That's I'm not yet point. at the point of, oh, I want to master this skill for myself and just nobody knows about it. Like, Yeah, it puts, it puts a whole different level of pressure on you. I mean, yeah, now, yeah. I mean, I might be touring. That means I really have to get good at singing. <laughs> and I've wanted this dream for 22 years. So what's a faster way for me to learn how to sing than to be like, okay, here are tour dates, <laughs> you know? Are you planning that? Yes. At what time? I don't know, but hopefully soon, because I'm excited to just <laughs> suck on stage really bad. <laughs> going to be so fun. And it takes the, now that I realize how bad I will be, because obviously when you start something, you will be so bad. Mm-hmm. I'm going to make the, like the name of my tour, something like Sorel's really shit. Come and watch her suck. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm excited to do that and take the pressure of, of, uh, being so polished and serious and like, you've got your shit sorted out. Cause I, It, there is something beautiful about watching people really suck at something and then progress 100%. and witnessing that journey and allowing life to be a bit of a joke. Because, mm-hmm. damn, we take it seriously. We do. We do. And at the end, we are all going to die. All of us will be in a coffin or our bodies will be burnt. We will no longer exist. It, everything that we're going through has a cosmic level, like a, like a, there's something funny about this. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. People think that my ass is like big, bitch, you're going to be dead. It's really good to, to, uh, it sounds morbid, <laughs> but to always have that like behind your ear. I heard uh, the happiest, one of the ha- happiest countries in the world, they, it's written in to their like, I don't know, guidelines or whatever, to think about death at least three to five times a day. Might it be Bhutan? I think so. I think so. Yeah, I think about death all the time. I went through a phobia of death and now death is my friend. But that's an interesting thing because we talked a bit about COVID. Mm -hmm. For me, what COVID showed is like, are we like, we as a society need to talk about death here. Oh my God, we're so afraid. How can we go... Like, of course, it's sad when old people die. Yeah. Of course. But that is That's what happen. happens. <laughs> that is what happens. <laughs> How far are we going to go to prevent yeah. something that's a natural occurrence of life and death? Yeah. Like, if, we're, we're willing to destroy it, everything are we, else. Are we not going to have that conversation? Or are we just going to continue to be this afraid of death? Yeah, I think there's a... Collectively, again, people are afraid to talk about death, I think, because they're not fully living. So when you confront them with the reality of like, oh, you're going to die, it's like, but I can't die because I haven't done this, this, and 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 this. So they don't want to think about death. It is pretty interesting that we, you know, even putting people in coffins and we put makeup on them. (laughs) (laughs) I hadn't thought of that. I hadn't thought of that. Like, come on, they're dead. Why are you trying to make them look pretty? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's a good point. It's a really good point. We're so afraid of death that we try to make it look pretty. That's a really good point. Because I think, I, I don't know, I'm just thinking about it now, like with COVID and the collective, like if we are <laughs> that afraid of death and we are that much trying to brush it aside as something that's not going to happen, 
that is preventing us from living. Yeah. L- like I think you can never live your life really fully yeah. unless knowing that's what is coming. Yes, for sure. Yeah. We have to face off with death. Now that I think about it, I'm super grateful for my phobia of death, even though I had like panic attacks for three years, I think two years. Now it's my friend. And when I think about it, it's almost like a relief as well. Not that I'm I'm not saying that if you're uh, suicidal right now, (laughs) Um, but it's everybody's journey as well. No, but it's just energetically. I mean, this might, I don't know, for some people that are listening or watching, it might sound morbid, but it's just the truth that like when you come into the world, you come in on it on an inhale. Yeah. And the nervous system, if you inhale it, but the death is the ultimate exhale, the ultimate release. And so many stories like Zach Bush. Do you know Zach Bush? I love Zach Bush. I've been listening so much to Zach Bush. My friends know him very, really well. You probably you probably listen to podcasts of my friends, Blue and Andre. They're amazing. Yeah, um, but, but if, if there is one person that I would like to have on my podcast, it's Zach Bush. Zach is a, I love the guy. Yeah, yeah, he's amazing. It's just when, when he's talking, I don't even have to... Uh, my reasoning can go out of the window. I just... I just feel resonate, his, right? I just feel because this is true. This is true. This yeah. is true. This is true. This is true. <laughs> yeah. And on that note, I think that in the future, we're not going to, I think we were so, and I've gone through this personally in my own life. I heard words and I knew that it wasn't right, but I still, because the brain has been, yeah. we've thought the pressure, uh, the weight of the brain has been more important than the heart for so long. And I think we're shifting now that we don't need to hear what people are saying. We're going to feel what's going on. And I think actually that could be a what the future of humanity holds is we'll just yeah. be feeling each other. And if your energy is not on point, like I am now, I, yesterday I went and unfollowed a lot of people, not because of what they've said to me, but because like I looked at their profile and I was like, I don't resonate with your energy. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to start really focusing on that because I will, I now, from what I'm just going through right now, I am only focusing on energy now. Mm -hmm. And I don't give a fuck who you are, what you have on offer, what you say to me, your words mean nothing because I know how much words can be skewed. Mm -hmm. Politicians are a perfect example of it. Um, Yeah, but I, I, I agree with you. Like there's, I think I had a guy on my podcast when COVID was like, and, and he was really talking against all of it. Yeah. Really free. Yeah. And I had so many people messaging me. It's like, everything he's saying is such bullshit, but it still kind of makes sense. Yeah, interesting. Because they were feeling it. Feeling. I know, I'm excited for that. So we're going to, ha- everybody's going to have to work so much on their energy. Like you will not be able to fool another person. Like now that I've, exp- oh, I, can't, I can't say too much, but there's, uh, fuck. I will know when someone's energy is toxic from now on. Mm -hmm. You will not be able to fool me. And so no matter what you, yeah, again, no matter what masks you're trying to put on, I will stay the fuck away from you Mm -hmm. if your energy is off. So, but yeah, Zach Bush. Um, Yeah, listen to his kind of stuff. I don't know why we brought him up, but essentially. No, but it's good to bring him up. Yeah, because he's awesome. For the people that are listening, because not, I think he's not still like a mainstream. No, but he's becoming it. He is becoming it, yeah. Oh, yeah, Yeah. so much. And yeah, his, oh yeah, that's why I brought him up because he used to be, uh, he's three times certified physician or something. Very high level doctor. He used to resuscitate people from death Mm -hmm. um, daily. That was his job. And so at one time he he tells a story of resuscitating three different people from three different backgrounds. One was an old man. One was like a black uh, man in his 40s and one was a teenager. Um, and they all died and he resuscitated in one day and they all, he brought all of them back, which is very rare to bring every single person back. But every single one of them, the very first thing that they said after they died, after they were brought back was, why did you bring me back? Mm -hmm. And all of them, he tells stories of the amount of people he's brought back and all of them say that they feel like this unconditional acceptance and love for the very first time in their life when they finally die. Like it's like freedom and this ultimate exhale that you were saying Mm -hmm. of like, thank you. And they just feel love. They feel only love. And like, that's what we're afraid of right now. And there's evidence time and time and again of, of, of people that have had near death experiences. And the way that they describe it is all beautiful, 
all of it. Mm-hmm. And yet we just sit here because we don't discuss it and we sit and think that that's the scariest thing that will ever happen to us, but maybe it's the greatest gift. Mm-hmm. And so if we embrace the fact that we have this gift coming to us at the end of our lives, and this is a playground that we get to experience lots of pain and lots of ecstasy, and we get the chance to look at sunsets. Exactly. And we're aware of the fact that we are witnessing our own existence Mm -hmm. and we get to work on ourselves. And I have this idea that the universe, that we are all God, that is experiencing itself. Mm -hmm. So God was like, ooh, I want to know what this pain feels like. So it creates someone to go through the deepest pain. It's like, whoa, that was crazy. And we're just like a little pinky on God's God's body, whatever God is, universe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so you're this little tiny pinky that's experiencing this one tiny aspect of life. And then it's just sending messages back to God to expand God's awareness and reality of what's possible, what's not possible, what it can feel. So it, it's just, God is just wants to, God universe just wants to grow as well. Mm-hmm. And that's what it's doing. So we have to fully experience every aspect of life as humans, because we are just an extension. We are God. 100%. I'm with you. Beautiful. So grateful to have you on. Love talking to you. This was fun. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much.